liberty lovers and welcome to the liberty mike podcast broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of dixie i am michael and i am here with liberty larry how's it going doing all right how are you today oh pretty good a lot better now yeah i got a mexican firing squad yeah you're in like my cup <laughs> tearing through that drink too i see dude that's good man <laughs> like that is that is a good drink yeah it's 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 solid um i'm glad i came across that one yeah it's a really good tequila drink that's not a margarita <laughs> <laughs> it really is like it's well and it's like I don't know, it's sweet, it's fruity, like, mm-hmm. I, but it's tangy too. Yeah, like, yeah, it's, it's got it's got the tart from both the lime and the grenadine. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Like I said, and I make my own grenadine now, so yeah, yeah, it's it's very good. It came out well. Yep. Um, and you know who doesn't like tequila, right? <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> this is like anybody that went through college probably doesn't. So <laughs> in some way, this is going to be a tequila podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Could be out of control. It could get crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Especially as quick as you're drinking that. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Sucking it down. It's been a long day. It has been and a long day. And it won't end. The damn sun won't go down. <laughs> Dude, like, I love this time of year. Like, I love the sun staying up till 8 o'clock. Yeah, mm-hmm. I don't. I um, I you want get darkness. so much more done, man. Like, especially like with me when I don't get off work till late. Yeah. It gives me time to work on the car or get in the yard. Whatever mm-hmm. I kind of want to do that needs daylight. <laughs> So I guess that's fine for you, but it's great for me. What are you talking about? <laughs> but I don't, I don't like it. I don't like it. I, um, I do remember being in, uh, England in the summer though. Yeah. Um, actually I guess it was around this time of year and, uh, the sun wouldn't go down till like 10 o'clock. Oh man, that would be so amazing. And then it was up at like four. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be, that would be great. And it doesn't like we were talking a minute ago, like, mm-hmm. With the sun coming up early, like that doesn't bother me either because like it helps me get up if I need to get up. Yeah. But I can sleep right through it if I need to. Like, yeah. It doesn't bother me to sleep when the sun's out. Like. And then even in the farther northern latitudes when I was in Alaska and the sun would, would go down at like midnight and be up at like three in the morning. <laughs> um, that would just be weird. <laughs> it was weird. I, I, I can't sleep through any kind of sunlight really. Oh, man. Nah. And so... I um I did not sleep while we were there. They had blackout curtains, but it wasn't enough. Like it, it, it creeps around the edges. Yeah, you, know, you can't like completely cover up the. You got to cover your windows with uh, tin foil or something. Yeah, um, or yeah. paint them black. Or <laughs> I don't know. Just have no windows at all. Right? Yeah, forget windows. Who needs windows? Yeah, right. <laughs> windows are overrated. <laughs> Board them up. <laughs> um. Yeah, and I I didn't get a lot of sleep up there. Although that was a really nice trip. Yeah, it was, it was pretty country. Yeah. Danny and I went outside and watched the sunset at midnight. That's so weird. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and locked ourselves outside. And then yeah. we're like banging on the door. This is like the last, or one of the, if not the last, like good trip with dad where he was still like, like up moving and around, yeah. uh, you know, well enough. And, and uh, he, we, you know, we're banging on the door, banging on the door. Cause we went out in our, like in our pajamas <laughs> to and, watch the sunset. Yeah. To watch the sunset <laughs> at midnight. And uh, even this time of year, man, Alaska gets cold at night. Oh, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so th- now we're cold. We're ready to get like the sun was, it was a pretty sunset. And we're going back inside and we can't get back inside. And we're like, <laughs> you know, no socks or shoes on. This is going <laughs> like, to become an emergency very yeah, quick. <laughs> t-shirt and pajama pants. You know, and it was, uh, it was starting to get uncomfortable. We're banging on the door and banging on the door. Dad had gone to bed hours before. Yeah. And, uh, and finally we see him at the top of the stairs in our, in our I'm going to put air quotes around cabin. It was like the nicest. Yeah. It's like nicer than my house. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, we see him at the top of the stairs. He came out of his room. He starts walking down the stairs and he sees us at the door and he shakes his head and turns around and starts walking back up the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no, wait, wait. You have to let us in. <laughs> but he, he let us in, of course. So he's like, oh, that's great. <laughs> and that's such a him move, too. Yeah. Like the whole, like, shake his head and go back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was a good trip. Mm. Um, we don't have anything that nice to talk about this week, I guess. Yeah. So does that get you excited about the podcast? <laughs> 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 really selling our stuff here. Yeah. Um, no so I don't know. I guess we start with like talking more about budget things. Yeah. Um. You know, they passed something. Yeah. 
what, what did you say, Matt? You you were talking about something that Massey had said about it, weren't you? That um maybe, but I can't remember now. Something like that he he um he signed off on it. Oh, reluctantly, but. That was the first time he'd ever seen anything close to a cut. <laughs> yeah, like he wasn't like enthusiastic about mm-hmm. it, but he was like, he was like, you know, like this is at least resembling like a cut. And he said, we've literally never cut anything the entire time I've been here. Mm-hmm. So it, he kind of had like a what the hell attitude about it. <laughs> yeah, this is the best thing I've ever seen. So yeah, let it go. Um which is just sad commentary in and of itself, like yeah. you know. Well, I mean, I guess there are a few things that I wanted to talk about it, um, talk about talk about about it. Talk about with it. Talk sure. Um, <laughs> there, I, I wanted to talk about the sacred cows. Oh yeah. Issue. So there's things that they're not allowed to touch. They're not allowed to touch any time, and it's. You know, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and the military. None yep. of these things can be cut. These things have to remain. Well, now, of course, the only one of those things that's even in discretionary funds is is military. Um, yeah. The rest of it's already allocated. And they always say that they can they can never change. You know that they can never touch the the already allocated stuff, the non discretionary right. spending, whatever the fixed spending or whatever they call it. Yeah. Um. Now, I mean, I'm pretty sure the house has the power to touch anything it wants. Well, they do. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, like, yeah, they absolutely do. And uh, I was listening to David Stockman talk about it. Of course, he was um, Office of Management and Budget and uh, under Reagan, I think. Um, and so he he knows this stuff really well. And he said that this was the moment that the Republicans should have held the line. Yeah. And just said, okay, we're not signing any of this. Because when it came around time for the quote unquote default, that doesn't happen. Yeah. He said it, it, it won't happen. It can't happen. Yeah. The uh, U.S. government takes in far more revenue than the cost of the, um, the, of uh, the interest on those. To service the debt. Yeah, to service the debt. Yeah. And he said, so what happens is when they don't have, when they don't have the budget, what happens is they have to start um, specifically allocating for uh, priorities. Yeah. And that that would be a priority. Yeah. And even like covering the cost of the military operations, cost of the military would be a priority and paying out social security and all that stuff would be a priority and that they could cover all of those things, but it would force them to have to talk about what things they needed to start thinking about cutting. Yeah. Well, and it would, so, so the way I'm understanding this is like, so Congress would have to just go through and like, each time we're going to spend money, like basically pass it. Like, is that the type of situation we're talking about? Or, or who would be making the decisions? We pay this, but not this, um, I guess is my question. Yeah. He said, and I don't remember, but, but it's, but there is like a body that would make that decision. Yeah. I want to say it goes to the executive actually really? to do it. See, but, I, see, I thought I had heard the same type thing in that, I want to say the thing that I had heard, like the argument was, and this was so absurd when I heard Mm -hmm. it. That's the reason like this made me think of it is that, you know, like the president just doesn't have time to sit down and, and sign all of these documents that we're going to do this and we're not going to do that. We're going to do this and we're not going to do that. What else does he do? Well, that was my thing, especially (laughs) when you're talking about Biden. Like, like, are you kidding me? Like, come on. Mm. So, Um, but I could just picture this old man, like just, when that when I heard it, like I just pictured Biden, like this old man trying to sign all of these as quick as he could. You yeah. Know? <laughs> well, I, I you know I should have written it down, but I I was listening to the interview when I was driving home from Summerdale yesterday, so yeah, I just I wasn't in a position to write it down. And I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, but there it, I, it was I, a Tom Woods uh, show episode oh, really? that okay. yeah that he had David Stockman on talking about it. So oh, I may go check that out. Then. Um, um. So for those of you that want to listen. That, that's where I mean, you can I want to say it. I had heard that that was that it was the executive that mm-hmm. like made the determination, but don't quote me because yeah, I could well, be me mistaken. either. <laughs> yeah, me yeah. either. Um, but you know, uh, Rand Paul actually gave a really good speech on the. I hear you, cat. Um, on the floor about this, that like you know things need to start changing, and but what he was pointing out is that if you've taken out 
the Medicare can't be touched. The Social Security can't be touched. The military can't be touched. Um, he said, first off, like the discretionary spending is only a third of the budget to begin with. Yeah. And if you say you can only, you, you can't, you can't touch non-discretionary spending. That means that two thirds of your budget already is untouchable. Yeah. Then roughly, roughly half of the discretionary budget is the military. If you can't touch that, then you've taken out half of the remaining third. So you only have about 15% of the, the budget that you are allowed to play with. If you've cut all these things, like protected all of these other areas. Yeah. And if you eliminated that entire remainder, you've done nothing. You can't, yeah. You, yeah. You, I mean, you, I mean, you, yeah. You, you've you're still in even, the hole. Yeah, yeah. You're not, you're not getting to where you need to be for sure. Yeah. So you, you can't balance the budget even if you, if you get rid of that entire last fifteen percent of the budget that isn't already set aside as not as being a sacred cow. Um, and of course, now what he was advocating for is, um, well, he he was going back to years ago. His penny plan. Do you remember that? I va- like I remember the name, but I don't remember the specifics. Yeah. So years ago, he he was proposing uh, that they do a one percent cut on everything. Yeah. One percent across the board, um, and do that year year over year, and that you could balance the budget in some not unreasonable amount of time. Yeah. If you did a one percent cut on everything, like yeah. every single thing in the budget every year. Yeah. Um. Now he's like, well. We need to do more like 5%. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, but uh, as that is the way, like if you're going to try, if, if you were serious and we're not, by the way, like our, at least our government is not serious about this problem. Even the people who pro- proclaim they are, are not serious about it. But yeah. if they were like, that would be the tact you'd have to take yeah. is like, we're go- nothing's off the table mm-hmm. and we're not. And, and I'm as much as I'm a libertarian, I want to burn it all down. Um, I'm not opposed to the idea of gradually cutting it back because the, I mean, I understand that you're not just going to like slash the budget all at one time yeah. because it's going to be too much of a shock to the system. Mm -hmm. Um, So the idea of all of these departments having to get together and every year being like, all right, we're going to lose a little more. We're going to lose a little more. Yeah. Like that's the way to do it. Well, you have a lot of people that are dependent on these things, which is itself a problem, but. Um, Which but you can't just like leave. Got them. it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, and I understand that. Like, and that's the reason I think like that type of proposal would be the way to do it. Yeah. Um, but the truth is we're just not serious about it. Like there's mm-hmm. nobody up there with the exception of a handful, um, Rand Paul being one of them. Um, are really serious about this issue. Yeah. Um, it's all just posturing, which is the reason that they pushed it to pass this next election because they don't mm-hmm. want to fight over this again. Well, and, and it's so much worse than as well because what they pushed past the next election is determining what the ceiling will be. Yeah, because we don't even have a cap right now. Yeah. They just like suspended the debt ceiling, which we have So mentioned. what that incentivizes, of course, is to spend as much as you can between now, now and then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and it, let's be real about this. So the fact that they've kind of broke that barrier of mm-hmm. not extending it and... And, and not and, putting a number on it? Yeah, that's how it is now. Like that's gonna yeah, that's probably that's right. the new normal. Like mm-hmm. whenever we get to this inroad again, like that will be the fight of well, are we gonna suspend it again? There, yeah. It won't even be a mention of a number again. Yeah. Like it won't come up. Like mm-hmm. that. This is the way we do it now. You're probably right. Damn, I hadn't so. even thought about that. Um, so back to these sacred cows, though. Like you have the military now. The U.S. government spends more on military than. Like the next 10 countries combined or something like that? Yeah, I saw some stats on it a while back that was just ridiculous. It it wasn't that long ago that the U.S. spent more on its military than the rest of the world combined. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But even our supposed, you know, peer competitors, China's really the only one, but they throw Russia in there too. Um, The U.S. spends on average 10 times as much on its military as Russia does and five times as much on its military as China does. China's got 1.3 billion people and a whole lot more land. (laughs) Yeah, they do. um, And still spends 20% on their military what the U.S. spends on it. Well, they're not extended all over the globe. They're not an empire. In the same way we are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And uh, and so if, if the goal was to protect the United States and its interests, you could do it on half, at worst, 
half yeah. of what they do. Um, now, of course, what we what we do really understand about the whole military uh, issue in the United States is is a, it's a giant um, welfare program for for military contractors. Absolutely, it's just a way of privatizing public funds um, that produce way more than you need. Yep, and uh, and that way they get to take your tax money, give it to these companies who then actually spend back into lobbying you, your <laughs> tax money. Yeah, um, so that they can get bigger and bigger contracts. Yeah, you have, you know, all these companies like uh, Northrop Grumman and um, Lockheed Martin and so forth that get almost all of their revenue from government contracts. They're not a yeah. part of the market. They're a totally separate entity. Yeah, um, and it's just a waste. Oh, absolutely, it's just a waste. And I can go into more detail on that, and I have before on the podcast, so go back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, actually, I think there's a really good article way, way back um, on the website about. Uh, about spending so, on on military contracts and so forth. I think yeah. it was printed at Libertarian Institute too, so you can look me up at Libertarian Institute, yeah, um, and find that article. But anyway, uh, then of course the Social Security. Social Security is the one that they're always, always, yeah. always and talking so about. So we were talking about Social Security at the house the other night mm -hmm. like, with um, my my mom and my brother and whatnot, and it just like the thing that. I just got to say, like, the mm -hmm. thing that irritates me most about Social Security is, is so, like, because the people who have paid into it have a real argument. Oh, the yeah. The fact that, you know, we paid for this all of our life, and mm -hmm. now you're talking about us not getting it. Yeah. Um, the problem is, is you paid into a Ponzi scheme. Yeah. Because the, it's not like the government took that money from you, put it aside for you, and it's like, it's like a retirement account. Yeah, that's no, what it was supposed they, to be. That was the um, idea. My, my grandmother hated it to the day she died. It was instituted during her lifetime, and she was really yeah. upset about it. Yeah. Like, why would I trust the government to, to protect to do my this money? For me. Um, yeah. But yeah, here's the dirty little secret that people don't really seem to understand. They're like, okay, well, we can't you know, do this because we can't cut uh, Social Security. We can't take money away from Social Security. The dirty little secret is they already spent your money. The money's gone. Yeah, they spent the your money, money decades ago. Never there. Well, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, like it was stolen long ago by the government. Yeah, yeah. Bec and all they had to have done was put that money to the side for those people, even if they didn't put it in their own individual accounts, even if they had taken all the money that everybody paid in, put it separate, and then that was the money for Social Security in the future, it probably still wouldn't be solvent, but it wouldn't be in the crisis as in now. Yeah. You know? Well, and the Office of Management and Budget has been saying for years and years and years that this thing's falling apart. Yeah. Like, that it'll be completely... Um, it'll completely collapse in a few years. Yeah. And at some point, some politicians have to step up, have to be the brave people and step up and say, look, it's already lost. Yeah. It's already lost. We can't keep doing this. Yeah. You're not getting your money anyway. Yeah. So, you know, let's, let's cut our losses here yeah. and not doom the whole nation to <laughs> over. insolvency over this thing. Yeah. Like, we're really sorry. Well, you know, Create some kind of plan to pay out as much as you can to the people that have put the most into it over their careers. Well, I would even be for, and once again, a very unlibertarian take here. Well, but I, I, there's you know, you there's gotta, no libertarian answer to this. So right, I the mean, you answer, have to have you have to have the ability to to make a move at least in the right direction. It yeah. may not be purely libertarian, but but I think the right move is you you pay it out to the people who need it the most, mm -hmm. the people who actually like are going to be like surviving off yeah, those checks. destitute if you the don't. The destitute yeah. people should get paid out and the people, and, and not, like I said, I hate the idea of it, but the people who have done better and done the right things, mm -hmm. you know, they just don't get it, you yeah. know? Um, and it's not a perfect solution, but I don't, the situation we're in, what else do you do? You know, because you're, you're literally talking about like collapsing mm -hmm. the entire country over it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, the, the, this and the healthcare, Medicare, issue are, are similar in a lot of ways. Yeah. Now, the the dissimilarity is, of course, like this wasn't... Medicare isn't a Ponzi scheme exactly. Yeah. Um, but it has created... So uh, someone that I met recently and have a, a high degree of respect for um, said to me that healthcare can't run on a free market system. Okay. I haven't, I, mean, I haven't really gotten to talk to her to have her like really explain that to me. Why? Why that's the conclusion they've came to. I 
on at least my initial reaction is I absolutely don't agree though. Yeah. Um, I, I think that the problem with the healthcare system right now is that it hasn't been a free market for so long. Well, that was going to be what I was going to say is once, one, once you go so far down the rabbit hole, mm -hmm. I can see how somebody would come to that conclusion. Yeah. And yeah, we're down that rabbit hole. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah um, absolutely. Like, I mean, so I get why somebody would think that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that what you have to consider is, is, You've got to find some way to wind it back closer to a free market system. You do, but I, I mean, I, I can provide some historical evidence that it can function on a oh, market I'm sure. system. Yeah. Um, the the main thing is that prior to Social Security or prior to Medicare, yeah. um, Medicare's inception in the in 1965, yeah. that healthcare costs rose um, with CPI. Yeah. Generally. Yeah. Um, it's very close alignment with us, with, you know, the, uh, consumer index. Yeah. That um, would make sense. Yeah. After the institution of Medicare, um, healthcare costs have risen at roughly double CPI every year since. Yeah. And why <laughs> is that? Mike? Well, uh, there's, there's a few reasons. Yeah. Um, the main thing is that there, there's been a lot of other legislation that goes along with it, uh, both before and after, um, that limited supply yeah. of healthcare products, including physicians. So um, the, the government gave more power of licensure to the AMA. Yeah. And while the American Medical Association, I mean, I don't know a whole lot about it. Who knows? But it strikes me like on the surface, my, my instinct is that it's like every other professional licensure institution where its job isn't really to ensure quality, but it's into, to limit competition. Yeah. Um, so the, the first thing that the AMA did was, uh, was actually pull the, um, accreditation, I guess is what you'd call it for a whole bunch of medical schools. They essentially shut down, or um, or combined like half the medical schools in the country. Really? Yeah, to uh, limit the number of physicians that were being produced each year. Interesting. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> that, that's not a very free market solution. No, no, it's not. Um, there, you know, of course, we, we've talked many times about a lot of the uh, prescription drug stuff that's gone on that's limited competition, that's... that's um, limited the number of products that are out there, uh, limited who is allowed to produce them, yeah. you know, so on and so forth. Um, yeah. those type of things drive up cost. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a monopolization technique, which, yeah. um, which of course just results in less competition and therefore higher prices. Yeah. Uh, so, but at the same time you have, while that kind of legislation has been going on as well, then you have Medicare and, um, you know, Obamacare and other things that have, uh, subsidized, um, subsidized the demand. Yeah. So you've limited the supply. Yeah. You've subsidized, subsidized the demand. Yeah. So you have a much higher demand, a much lower supply. And what's the result? I mean, look at your economics charts. You've seen supply demand charts. There's no other option except for prices to rise. Yeah. And, and so that's, of course, what's happened. Yeah. Um, now, I don't have a quick answer to, to this either. Yeah. <laughs> well, because I think, it, I think you know, we're so far down the road. You, start, you just got to start rolling some stuff back. Yeah. You got to limit the number of people that get these programs at first. Um, yeah. Well, I think I you know. have to start slow, like the same way we talked about with the budget earlier. Like you just have to, you have to start slow because the idea would be is to wind it back to, you know, a free market system. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing has happened with the student loan debt. Um, the reason the student the reason it costs so much to go to college is because the government stepped in years and years ago and started subsidizing it. Yeah. And once you go down that rabbit hole, the colleges don't, I mean, there's no reason for them to keep tuition low because the government's paying for it anyway. Right. Um, yeah. If the government permits so much money for a service, why would you ever charge less than that? Exactly. Yeah. Um, now, the other uh, part of this, you know, limiting competition thing is the um, the government institution of the certification of need yeah. uh, 
uh, agreements for healthcare facilities, which essentially says that um, that in order to build a new healthcare facility, you have to receive a certificate of need from the government. And of course, this just creates this incredibly corrupt practice where the existing um, healthcare facilities uh, can lobby to limit competition moving in. Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, and they do. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, well, the whole idea that it, the it government... favors the existing large healthcare facilities. Yeah. Well, the whole idea that the government's going to know where the next hospital needs to go. I mean, you don't... I yeah, mean, exactly. So what ends up happening is they just contact the hospitals that are already there and say, hey, do you want another hospital here? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, how do you think that no. conversation is going to go? You and, know? and because so much of the other um, bureaucratic legislation that goes on around healthcare, the... the uh, oh, what do you call the... Um, the amount of revenue you have to generate in order for you to profit. You know what I'm... There's there's oh. a word for this. The say it again. The amount of revenue you have to generate in order to profit. Oh, uh, like yeah. the difference between like your uh, your profit margins. Yeah. Why was yeah. that so hard? <laughs> I don't know. I couldn't I get know. it either. So <laughs> your profit margins have gotten to be very low. Yeah. Um, and so all these healthcare facilities have to run in your capacity. Uh, yeah. In order to be profitable, to, to make money, yeah, and so they don't want somebody else in there opening up a whole bunch of beds and giving another option. Yeah, they want to make sure that their beds are full because yeah. that's the only way that they can generate a profit. Yeah, yeah. Um, all of these problems don't exist in a free market. <laughs> that's true. That's true. I mean, the whole idea of a free market and and the the whole supply demand thing is that if if supply is limited, it drives prices up which incentivizes the people that are already providing the service to provide more of the service and incentivizes other people that are not providing the service to provide the service because it's a high profit service to provide. There's money to be made. And so therefore the supply increases and it drives the price down. Yeah, exactly. And it drives quality up. Yeah, Absolutely. Because now you're, you're in you real go, competition for... Because you want to go to the good hospital. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, not the one that's the only one that's available that's mm-hmm. always crummy. <laughs> but hey, this is all theoretical, right? It doesn't work in the real world? I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> I know which world world I want to live in. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, so that's really all I have about that. It's just, it's just that we've put ourselves... Like, it's a real quandary in... Um, the answer seems to be, well, we can't change anything. We'll just keep on down this road until it completely self-destructs. And well, I don't just mean Medicare and social security. I mean the whole the national economy in general. Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just, that's, it's just so crazy and everybody seems to admit it and know it. Like we're on a collision course here mm-hmm. and there's, it, it's, it really is a flaw. I think with, with our system in general, <laughs> I just thought of the scene in Galaxy Quest when they're trying to go shut down the self-destruct or whatever it is in the ship. It just made me laugh. Anybody who's seen that, it's got to make you laugh. Yeah. All right. Then it's it's totally irrelevant. I don't, I'm not going to describe it. Just, uh, but yeah, like we're on this, like, and there's like no will to stop it. Like, yeah. So, um, so our, we got issues in the Middle East, uh, Saudi Arabia is creating problems by making friends. Oh yeah, you can't have that. Yeah, so they're they're making friends with Iran, and that's you know like the whole purpose of the Abraham Accords and so forth was to build a coalition um, with Israel in the Middle East against Iran. Yeah, and uh, and Saudi's Saudi's just totally screwing that up. Yeah, and Israel's really unhappy about it, and uh, and the U.S. is too because. Israel's really because unhappy. We're basi- because Israel yeah. is basically the 51st state. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I mean, we are now giving more money to Ukraine than Israel, though. Uh, well, maybe maybe they're the 51st state. Yeah. <laughs> this is know. new and it won't last. I was going to say, yeah, that's nowhere near as permanent, permanent as Israel. So. Um, now, uh, there you know, there's a lot going on here. So, Iran... The U.S. has been pushing Saudi Arabia for a, a normalization of relations with Israel. Um, 
Saudi has responded by saying uh, they feel like they have leverage in this situation over the U.S. So um, Saudi Arabia has said, um, you know, we want some concessions, including uh, U.S. support for a civilian nuclear program in Saudi Arabia. Now, Israel says, absolutely not. We can't have Saudi Arabia nuclearizing, even though they're talking about a civilian nuclear program. Yeah. You have the same issue going on in Iran. Iran has and always has had a civilian nuclear program. Yeah. Um, there's a really good book uh, by Gareth Porter on this called Manufactured Crisis. Um, it's extremely well documented and makes a very convincing argument that there never was a military, like a nuclear weapons program in Iran. Yeah. That their their nuclear program has always been civilian. That there was discussion about whether they wanted to pursue a weapons program, but they chose not to. Yeah. But of course, Netanyahu gets out there every couple of years and tells you that that Iran is six months from a nuclear yeah. weapon. They've been six months since two thousand one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and who, well, the, you know, the real irony of this. Okay, so Iran right now um, is saying that they will do whatever they f- feel that they need to do to prevent uh, Iran from. No, Israel has said that they will do whatever they feel they need to do to prevent Iran from um, developing a nuclear weapon. Uh, the issue is, of course, that Trump pulled out of the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, um, that Iran is already a member of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. So they have already agreed to have IAEA inspections to make sure that they're not developing weapons. Yeah. Um, the JCPOA just added another layer of inspections to ensure that there was no weaponization going on. Then we left that. Yeah. But they are still a member of the non-proliferation treaty. But since we have withdrawn from the JCPOA and um, reinstated sanctions on them, uh, they have started uh, enriching uranium to higher and higher levels. Yeah. And they are in violation of the JCPOA, but the JCPOA doesn't really exist anymore. Because part of the agreement was that if uh, if anybody... um, put sanctions on them that they weren't were no longer bound by the limits in the treaty. Yeah. So Which now that did. now that we've done that, yeah. Yeah. Um so we we talked about it a couple of years ago when Trump actually pulled out of this thing and, and everybody was making a big deal about how they had uh more uranium than they were more enriched uranium than they were supposed to have in the country and we were talking about how well it's because of the sanctions they can't export it. They yeah. used to export it. Now yeah. the sanctions have been put in place. They can't export it, and we're using that. Yeah. <laughs> the The result of the sanctions that we placed on them yeah. to, you know, to make a we're making a big issue out of it. Yeah. Um, I can't think of a better way of saying that. Uh, I'm sure there is one. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's the same kind of thing again. So now they've been enriching uranium up to higher and higher percentages because they're no longer bound by the treaty that we left. Yeah. Because we left it. Yeah. And um, Israel is making waves about that. And of course, Iran also uh, demonstrated that it now has, or at least claimed, I guess, um, that it has hypersonic missiles as well that can carry nuclear warheads, but they're not producing nuclear warheads. And regardless of what you think of, uh, of Iran and the trustworthiness, I think it's pretty fair to say that, that it is an authoritarian theocracy. Yeah. I think that everybody would agree with that. It's an authoritarian theocracy and with the Ayatollah on top and the previous Ayatollah Khomeini and this Ayatollah Khomeini have both agreed that weapons of mass destruction are off the table. They are in contradiction to the tenets of Islam. Yeah. They have forbidden the use of, uh, of weapons of mass destruction, Yeah. which means that it's a real crime in Iran. If anybody's actually developing nuclear weapons. Yeah. Um, and if you want more evidence that they don't really have an intention of using weapons of mass destruction, during the 80s in the Iran-Iraq war, Iraq was using chemical weapons against the Iranians that we helped them <laughs> yeah. produce, by the way, that the United States helped Iraq, Saddam, Saddam Hussein's Iraq, yeah. um, produce to use against the Iranians. And the Iranians had the capability of developing their own chemical weapons and using them, but they didn't, Yeah, even though they were being used against them. Yeah. So, I mean, times change, but 
Still, though, like principles usually stay. Yeah, especially religious principles like that. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, um, Israel's threatening to do whatever they need to do. And the, the irony of this is that Iran doesn't have a nuclear weapons program. I'm pretty confident. Yeah. And Israel does have an undeclared nuclear weapons program. I am pretty confident. It's actually yeah. kind of an open secret that Israel has a, an undeclared nuclear weapons program yeah. um, in violation of international law. And an international law that they didn't agree to, fair enough, but still. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and But we're clearly okay with it. Yeah, yeah. and nobody, yeah, nobody's stopping them. Yeah. Nobody knows how many nuclear weapons Israel has. What yeah. Israel really wants is to make sure that they are the only nuclear power in the Middle East. Yeah. I mean, that's the goal, yeah. right? So, uh, so we have all that going on. Yeah. Sounds like kind of a mess over there. Yeah, it always is. Isn't I, was, it? <laughs> well, I was fixing to say, kind of always is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it would be less of a mess if we wouldn't have gotten involved. Yeah. Ah, uh, you know, yeah, maybe. I mean, I would absolutely agree with that. But there's definitely an argument that the, the people on the other side would say that mm-hmm. our involvement has, has kept there from being a blow up. I well, I, I guess that's I would dis- too. I I disagree with that, but uh, yeah, I disagree with it as well. I mean, the the starting point, like going into the history of this, starting point is that the European colonial powers drew a bunch of arbitrary lines across the Middle East to create these nations. Yeah, uh, they without any regard to ethnic backgrounds or religious backgrounds or any of the the long standing feuds that already existed. Um, now, once they drew those lines. All of the individual powers within any given box yeah. wanted to control the whole thing because yeah. that's the nature nature of nation states. Yeah, yeah. Like if <laughs> if we hadn't drawn all the lines, there probably wouldn't be the same level of conflict because yeah. people well, would have, the lines would have developed naturally, right? You know, I mean that's and the, that's what the you lines already been. existed. There already were natural lines. That's kind of the oh, point. Oh well, yeah. Then there you go. You know, they yeah. just weren't on our maps. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, of course, there's the issue of the, um, you know, the UN giving away land to the uh, to the Jews that didn't belong to them. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's, that, that's a whole rabbit hole we can go down. <laughs> yeah, and then you know, then Israel has been an expansionist power since its inception, and uh, you know, um, which actually kind of brings us to our next thing, which is the U.S. State Department um, has. All right, let me let me say that again. The U.S. State Department has attacked Roger Waters. Roger Waters, the basis for Pink Floyd, Roger Waters, um, as an anti-Semite. Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. For a performance of The Wall that he recently did in Berlin. Yeah. Um, where they said the, the performance had a bunch of uh, anti-Semitic tropes and that he has a history. Well, okay, so they were... It was somebody within the state department that made the statement. Um, then one of the, uh, spokes liars was questioned about it and pressed and, uh, and they just doubled down. Yeah. Um, and said that, you know, Roger Waters has a history of anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic tropes in his shows. Now, I really hope that a lot of people out there have seen the wall. Yeah. Because yeah, there's a lot of Nazi like symbolism. There's a lot of like fascist symbolism. Yeah. It's not positive. <laughs> yeah. They're not promoting it, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's actually quite the opposite. And, and Roger Waters responded to this. Uh, now, I, I do think, let me say, I do think that a lot of this has to do is that with Roger Waters um, has been uh, a big human rights advocate throughout his career uh, for all people's rights, yeah. but including the Palestinians yeah. in Israel. Which there's some reason to want them to have be treated a little better. <laughs> yeah. To say the least, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, they're, they are second-class citizens in their own country. They aren't actually technically citizens. Yeah. It, and, and there's all the, all the occupied territories um, are illegally occupied by Israel. There are a bunch of territories within Israel proper uh, that are Palestinian, where the Palestinians live, but they're controlled by the uh, the Israeli government, including like 
what resources go in and out. And, I, you know, we've talked about this before. The, they severely limit the, the amount of water, the number of calories that can enter, um, people's movement across them. They've broken them up into these tiny little enclaves that aren't connected with each other. It's, it's kind of unreal. Yeah. Um, if you look at it objectively, it, it's hard to make an argument that this is okay. Yeah. I would say it's impossible, but I'm sure some people are capable. Yeah. Um, at any rate, Roger Waters said that the show was, quote, quite clearly a statement in opposition to fascism, injustice, and bigotry in all its forms. Yeah. End quote. I'm just, yeah. so... The, the, it just irritates me that the State Department has an opinion on this. Yeah. Like, that's my problem. <laughs> mm. Well, and it's one of those things where um, uh, pro-Israel and, and pro-Jewish groups have made these kind of statements about Roger Waters for a long time because he's been yeah. um, such a, a, such a staunch he's, he's supporter not, of Palestinian rights. Yeah, he's not on their side. Yeah. Um, but that the U.S. State Department would now do that as well is, is just unconscionable, I think. And um, as long as we're talking about the State Department, and we may as well wrap up on this more or less, I have decided recently that Anthony Blinken is the worst Secretary of State since John Foster Dulles. And now, you, John Foster Dulles was the uh, the Secretary of State that supported Hitler before World War II, um, yeah. who refused to engage with anybody that he disagreed with, who was just terrible. Blinken's done more or less the same. I, I would actually have done made this statement unhesitatingly if we hadn't had Hillary Clinton in between. I was going to say, yeah. You yeah. got to remember who was in there for at least a minute. Yeah. I mean, because you have Syria, uh, Yemen, and Libya all under Hillary Clinton. Yeah. Those are all disasters. But but then you have to, you have to think about like the... Um, Globally, it, it's quality, not quantity. You see, <laughs> yeah. And uh, when you when you look at it from the potential damages, um, his refusal to engage with the Russians over Ukraine, his refusal to engage with China over Taiwan, um, these are much bigger. Russia and China are much bigger actors than Libya, Yemen, and um, Syria. Yeah. And, and they have a she, potentially much greater impact I was on the world. Say, she kind of created a lot of chaos in one part of the world. <laughs> yeah. And uh, a part of the world that can be easily contained. Yeah. China and Russia can't be easily well, contained. Well, in the part of the world that's pretty well always in chaos anyway. Well, that's true. Not, not Libya, justifying what she did, but... You know, Libya was at least under control before yeah. that. I mean, yeah, I mean now you got open slave markets and a huge um, immigrant crisis in Europe. That's, oh, that's a not, result of the fall of... Um, of Gaddafi. Gaddafi. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying that she... I'm, She's an evil person. <laughs> yeah, and of course Yemen. You, that, man, the number of people that have starved oh, and died dude, from uh, diseases just... that are preventable over there is, uh, yeah. like, I mean, we've been talking about. I, I remember when we first started this talk about this podcast, and we were talking about Yemen being the biggest humanitarian disaster in the world. Yeah, and I had people saying, "What? What? Are, what about what Yemen? What's happening in Yemen? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right. Um, and and now it's become apparent, I think, to everybody. Yeah. To a lot of people. Yeah. And of course, in Syria, we helped create ISIS. Yeah. Yeah. They oh. just they just went the wrong direction. So that's that's some pretty bad stuff. But yeah. I, I think that the, the potential drawbacks of Blinken's plan is far worse. And yeah. in fact, uh, just in the last week or so, um, Blinken has spoken out again uh, in opposition to any kind of Ukrainian ceasefire. Um, he, he, he didn't make the point that he'd offered talks to Russia before the war even began and that they didn't have them. No. The part that he leaves out is that he offered talks to Russia, but he refused to talk about uh, Ukrainian um, membership in NATO, which was the only thing that Russia wanted to talk about. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, he offered talks on anything but what they wanted to talk about. But the thing that needed to be discussed. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, uh, of course, he canceled that trip a, a while ago to China because of the balloon. And, um, oh, I've forgotten about that. And I, I couldn't find this again, so I, I, I may not have the story quite right, but either he said or one of the generals that's responsible for war gaming around Taiwan um, said that uh, he'd been told by the State Department that he needed to, um, the, this general, 
uh, that he needed to um, have a plan to, he needed to be able to prevent the invasion of Taiwan or to defeat it. Yeah. If the first mission failed, he had a mission to prevent the invasion of Taiwan. And if the first mission failed, he had a mission to defeat an invasion of Taiwan. Now, my question to the State Department is, why is it the military's job to prevent the invade to prevent the war? Yeah, <laughs> isn't that the diplomats' that's, job? That's where the diplomats come. Yeah, in. do your damn job, we, Blinken. We have, we have these people for a reason. <laughs> yeah. So the the chief diplomat of the United States told the military that they're responsible for preventing a war. Well, and I'll tell you, and that's a big part of what's wrong with just our foreign policy in general is you have people you don't have diplomats that are acting in good faith. Yeah. You you have people who are there with an agenda and that they want to see that agenda push through. Mm-hmm. Not there to to actually t- t- try to tamper down or like come to a peace agreement. Like that's mm-hmm. not what these people are there for. That's not and they should be. Like that should be that should be the, the diplomat shouldn't have an agenda when it comes to Especially when you're talking about when war's on the table, mm-hmm. um, like the diplomats should be there to do just like to just try to tamper things down. Let's come to an agreement without having the uh, agenda put yeah. forth. Well, the the diplomatic answer in the United States now is just make threats. Well, we uh, it's, that's the only thing we know how to do. Yeah. Uh, well, we we've got the big stick and we've mm-hmm. decided we want to use it. Yeah. And and have for decades now. Yeah. That, so, that's absolutely true. Uh, well, you know what the, the the strange thing is that probably the best diplomat in high level in the U.S. government right now is in charge of the CIA. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Byrne was the diplomat, the Russian diplomat, um, Russian ambassador for years, and okay. um, of course, he's the guy that wrote the "Niet means Niet" yeah. uh, memo. Yeah, I remember um, that. But he's now the head of the CIA. So the best diplomat in the in high levels in the U.S. government right now is probably the the uh, director of the CIA. Wow, that's a sad commentary. No kidding. <laughs> so. Um, on that cheerful note. Yeah, I know. That's really all I have. Uh, all right. How do I how do I spin this? Um, it's not the Chinese. I don't know how to I don't know how to do reconciliation at the end of all this. Um, hopefully, the next administration will actually consider diplomacy something that the United States values. Yeah. Because that's that's really the problem is we don't value it. Like it's, it's just, we it's know our way or the highway. We we know we can, nobody can stop us and it's just full mm-hmm. steam ahead. Yeah. Well, um, the, the unfortunate truth is that we can be stopped. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and, but chances are, but the people will just stop ourselves. The people in charge don't recognize mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Um, chances are, we'll just stop ourselves by the way we run uh, the national economy. Yeah. So, um, yeah, fall of an empire. Yeah. Good times to be living. <laughs> Definitely interesting times. Good times to have a podcast. It's good times to have. There's plenty to talk about. <laughs> plenty to talk about. Yeah. Um, you know, the it, it goes back to the answer to all of this is to just have the government be less involved. Yeah. The the people of the United States don't want war with China. We don't we don't care enough about Taiwan for oh, that. Yeah. No um, same thing with Ukraine. Truth is, I mean, like, despite the propaganda, I know that there's plenty of people with the Ukrainian flag on their Facebook page or their Twitter oh, profile there, or whatever. There but, is. Um, but when it comes down to it, like, if you really sp- spoke in realistic terms to them, like, how many American lives are you willing to sacrifice for this? The answer is none. Yeah. I mean, for most people, um, you'd find very few that would that would be like mm-hmm. that would give you a number. Yeah. So. Uh, but you know, hopefully it's, God, it's weird again to say that like Trump's the one out there saying the right things. Now I think he's full of it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, he's, he's already proven once before that he does he's, he doesn't have great follow through. He's absolutely full of it, but it is nice to know that that message is at least being yeah. normalized. But yeah. That's because, the thing is that at least he's out there saying it. Yeah. I mean, it's the same reason that I supported Tulsi Gabbard. Yeah. And it's the same reason that I'll probably end up supporting RFKJ yeah. in this, is that at least they're out there saying the things that people need to hear, that they're not hearing anywhere else. Absolutely. Um, even though 
you know, both Tulsi and RFK, I like, there's a lot of things where I don't agree with their policies on it, yeah. but the things that are most important to me, well, they're and, saying the right things. And the things that they're leading on. Yeah. Because that's, that's the other aspect of that, that you have to mm-hmm. remember. Like there, this is, this is their issue. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially with RFK, like it's, it's, he's leading with, um, with Ukraine and COVID and that type of thing. Yeah. And there are things he's good on. Yeah. Well, oh man, I was so uh, disappointed. You see, um, they took a tiny little bit out of his uh, oh, announcement speech. Yes, I saw and that. And spun it up. That was um, everywhere. disgusting. It was dude. even covered badly by the No Agenda Show, who I I, us- I think usually does a really good job of... Um, of looking at things in context. So I haven't caught no agenda lately, so they messed this one up? Yeah, they messed this one up. Oh, that's a shame. Uh, so, yeah, I guess nobody went back and listened to the whole speech because, I mean, he he says this, there's this little section of it, but it's right after talking about how we need to have a conversation about this war with nuance. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the thing that I that I really respect about it. And and I guess it's, it's what's really missing. Okay, this is what we need, people. This is what you have to understand. This is how you can get along with anybody, even right. if they have very different views from you, is that you just have to... And it, like I've, I've experienced this in my personal life recently um, because I've gotten close to somebody who has very different views than me, and it hasn't been a problem. Right. And it hasn't been a problem because we both approach these issues with a sense of nuance, with an understanding that it's not cut and dried, that it's not yeah. black and white, that there's a lot of gray area. There's and, no good guys and bad guys. Yeah. There's just people. And and there's also a, a respect for the intelligence and the the reasoning behind it and an understanding that we both want the best. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, uh, what I keep thinking of is the, the line from... Um, uh, Tangled up in blue. Bob Dylan's Tangled up in blue. It's in the I think I think it's in the last verse actually, and there's a lot of verses, so yeah. it takes a while to get there in the song. But um, he says uh, we always did feel the same way. We just saw it from a different point of view. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's absolutely a good way to put it. Mm-hmm. And that's so anytime because I've got a lot of friends who I mean my political views are a little outside the norm to say the least. Yeah. So, I mean, I find myself in these debates with my friends a lot mm-hmm. and that's always kind of what I always come back to at least is like, we all want the same things. Mm-hmm. We just have different paths to get there. Yeah. Um, now I personally believe my path is the best, but you know, <laughs> I get, I get that there's people who think differently and, mm-hmm. and, you know, see things through a different lens. Yeah. I mean, this is the kind of, of reconciliation that I've been trying to promote on this podcast because I don't want to be a part of the continuing continuing split. Yeah. Like the continuing divide in politics and, and political discussion in this country. It's just understand that the, the person that you're speaking with, they're not terrible. Yeah. They want good things. Yeah. And and be respectful of of their position and and um and listen to how they got there. Yeah. Because and honestly, if you if you ever want to have any tr- chance of swaying them to your side, you're going to have to understand where they're coming from. That's true too. And yeah, yeah, you, you have to understand where they're coming from. And I mean, but don't think of it in terms of like I'm going to convince them that I'm <laughs> right. Yeah. Just well, just make your argument. Like yeah. you know, lay out lay out where you're coming from. Mm-hmm. You know, like that's that's what that's how I try to do it. I yeah. Don't know. And I, I find that I, I win more than I lose with that, with that <laughs> tact. I yeah. Mean, it, it, to me, the goal is to just to have the person think about something that either differently. From, yeah. In a way that they haven't thought about it before or just introduce some new information or, which or, was always in my mind, yeah. the goal of the podcast. Like I know yeah. we're not going to make everybody libertarians, but if we make some people at least look at these things from mm-hmm. a different perspective, that's a win, man. Yeah. I mean, I would just love to know that, that people have listened to this podcast and listen to us refer to various articles and books and, and thinkers and said, you know, that's kind of interesting and go check it out on their own. Yeah. Like if anybody has read Lysander Spooner because you've listened to this podcast over <laughs> the years, like I, I actually really want to know that. Yeah. Um, I love Lysander Spooner. He's one of my absolute favorites. And so if you haven't, you should. Yeah. <laughs> His stuff's easy. He's yeah. kind of a lively writer too. But um, yeah, you can, if, if you have, 
If you've gone and looked at some of the references that we've made and it's had an impact on you over the years, listen to this podcast. Um, let me know. Michael at the Liberty Mike.com. I'm, I'm curious about that now. Yeah. Like I, I would like to think that we've had that, hmm, that we've brought some new perspectives to people and, and had them look at things that they wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. That made me feel real good. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, on that note, they say that's a, that was better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll little, wrap it up there. A little foreshadowing for next week. So literally, as we've been sitting here, my phone's been blowing up with news. I guess they're fixing to indict Trump, or they have indicted Trump. Oh. I don't have a lot of details on it, but that's like coming through, like as we've been podcasting. Okay. So I'm well, sure. Well, there's a real question about whether we can even record next week. Yeah, that's. Um, I figured we'd have that conversation too. <laughs> Hopefully, we're gonna get one out next week, but yeah. we'll have to kind of see. It's it's questionable. It's definitely questionable. But if we do, I'm sure that the Trump stuff will be on the agenda. It might. I don't know. I, I'm kind of I've kind of <laughs> lost interest in all that. I hear you. It depends on what's what does, else is going on. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it depends. Like I say, I've read nothing on this. I did, mm-hmm. I know that there's a bunch of indictments that are out there for him. Or yeah. Potential indictments. I guess. I guess this will be the first. If it's some stupid little thing, we're not covering it. Yeah, I don't know. I've gotten a lot of alerts about it while we've been sitting here. So I'm sure there may be there may be something, or there may be nothing. There may Anything just, Trump is it big could news. just be the news of the night. Yeah. So I guess we'll see. Um. So uh, we'll try to be back next week. Um, next if we week can. is a little dicey. Next week is a little dicey. Maybe I'll maybe I'll do a little history thing for next week if we can't get together. That'd be cool. I could do. Um, I could do terror war or something after doing Vietnam. We could do the lies of the terror war after doing the lies of Vietnam. Hey, there you that'd go. Be, that could be fun. Oh, that might take me too long. I was going to say that may be that's heavy. A, that's, a lot of, <laughs> that's a lot of material. So, I have to limit myself if I do that. Give um, yourself parameters. <laughs> yeah. These are the lies that I'm going to talk about. Just, just these three, not the other 100,000. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll just we'll have to wait and see, I guess. So um, we'll be back when we're back, I suppose. We'll be back either next week or the week after. Yeah. And, um, you know, hopefully you have patience with us and stick around if we're not here next week. And uh, in the meantime, though, if you want to know when we have a new episode out, you can follow us on Facebook or subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, and or Podbean. I got to wrap up quick because Gary's being blinded. <laughs> yeah, um, the sun has moved into my direction. <laughs> it's no good. And uh, let's see, like and share, comment, subscribe. Um, you can always email me at michael at the liberty mic.com. Um, Tell your friends and all that other stuff. All that stuff helps us out. Uh, it's really simple for you. We don't have any cost for anything that we do. And we never will have a cost for anything that we do. Um, but yeah, so all that stuff's free and easy for you, but it really helps us out a lot. Absolutely. And uh, so we'll be back next time when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life's short, live free. Ciao. Later. Later.